in this message is being caught. Being caught. Uh, you could say being caught in a, now, in a now what moment, but being caught. Uh, if I ask for a show of hands, anybody ever been caught? Now, there's a mindset that probably went across the, the, the room here that, yeah, I've been caught. And you thought of it in a bad way. But you can be caught doing something good. You know, you can be caught uh, doing something that, that has a great intention around it. You know, if you're trying to do a surprise party or you're trying to, you know, put something together, you want to surprise somebody, and then you get caught. You're like, what are you doing? And, and, and it's kind of a caught. But then there's that being caught that's kind of negative, And that can just go in all kinds of different areas. And then, you know, the terminology of being caught off guard. It was just something surprised you. Uh, being caught, it's interesting. Uh, being caught, the word caught is used to refer to really an aspect of discovery. That's what, that's what it refers to, or um, capture, or removing the cover of something, and then and it reveals something. That's this idea I want us to key in on in this now what moment in our lives. Being caught's not necessarily bad, as I said earlier, uh, regarding something that ultimately, uh, in, in the negative, it's, it's something that when, when being caught is bad, it leads to bondage, it leads to uh, slavery, a demise, a termination of position or um, something of that nature, good or bad, uh, a situation. So think of this, a situation where someone is caught, good or bad, is always, using a key term here, always an opportunity for God to work in and through his people. Think about that. When, you're, when you've been caught, being caught, uh, it's always an opportunity, good or bad, whatever that caught is, uh, it's always an opportunity for God to work in and through his people. So we get caught over all kinds of things. You know, we get caught being right. We get caught being wrong. I like to be right, don't you? <laughs> I, I would rather be caught being right. Uh, we get caught looking at things we should look at. We get caught looking at things we shouldn't look at. We get caught saying things we should say, and we get caught saying things we shouldn't say. We get caught doing things we should do, and we get caught doing things we shouldn't do. Uh, there's all kinds of aspects of being caught, terms of being caught. Someone might say being caught red-handed. We've heard of that. Uh, caught off guard, I said that earlier. Caught with your hand in the cookie jar. Um, you know, they're calorie-free, fat-free, so it's okay then, right? Caught in the moment. Caught with your pants down. <laughs> caught in the act. Caught in the middle. I mean, all these different ideas of being caught. And we get it in that physical sense, but there's a spiritual aspect that I want to talk to you about that we need to understand what it looks like of being caught. And not just the person being caught, but a person that maybe has caught someone else, and we'll talk about that. Uh, when caught, in the negative sense, people will say things like, I didn't mean to get caught. I'm sorry. I don't know why I did that. That's not like me. And, and excuses, when someone's caught, excuses come about, and they try to take hold. When someone's trying to explain the aspect of being caught, that is a massive now what moment. And there's people's lives in this process <clears throat> of being caught that has been changed forever. Uh, movies are written about it, uh, sitcoms uh, uh, create comic relief about it, this idea of being caught, and, and the truth is, is it's something that we all have in common, being caught. Wouldn't it be great to be able to walk around life, to live your life in such a way that there was never anything to hide? I mean, that would be an ultimate freedom that many people really don't realize because they maybe have lived their life in such a way of being caught or being in a situation to where they feel like there's some things they need to hide. And, but wouldn't it be awesome if you could live in such a way that you just have complete freedom, that you're, we would say, a complete open book? I think that's a powerful idea. And the truth is, is people hide from their, from their past. Uh, they hide from the reality of maybe their finances, their choices, um, people hide from the aspect that other people know something about them, so they try to steer away from that. And, and these are all elements of being caught. The Bible brings to light an idea that I, that I really want us to, to take focus on because it, it doesn't just deal with the person 
being caught, but it also deals with the person who maybe has caught someone in, in such a way as we've talked about. But the Bible instructs us to walk by the Spirit, to walk by the Spirit. Uh, it's pretty specific to not just walk by the Spirit, but what it looks like to not walk by the Spirit. And I think sometimes people say, oh yeah, we've got to walk by the Spirit, but they haven't taken a lot of notice of what it looks like maybe in their life personally or what it looks like biblically to, to not be walking in the Spirit because if these things are present in your life, uh, that would mean you're not walking by the Spirit, yet somebody may be having these p- things present. We'll talk about those and say, yes, I feel the Lord has led me. I feel the Lord is, is speaking to me, yet they're not walking by the Spirit. Well, there's a problem there. And we need to look at that. Uh, Galatians 5.16. It says, but I say, walk by the Spirit. The Apostle Paul's writing this. He says, I I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. That's a pretty huge statement. If you're struggling with the things of the flesh, we'll talk about those. If you're struggling with, with this idea of not walking by the Spirit, how do you not get into this battle and this fleshly battle. Well, we walk by the Spirit and we won't desire those things that are contrary to the Spirit. So what are the desires of the flesh? So the Bible spells it out pretty, pretty much, pretty in detail here. Uh, Galatians 5, 19 through 21, it says, Now the works of the flesh are evident. It says sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, adultery, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. When I read through this, I'm like, this is a familiar passage here. I thought just about any and every TV show or movie has about all of these within it. Now, I'm not going to stand up here and go, we need to turn our TVs off, though we probably do. Uh, We need to guard our eyes and our minds and our thoughts. Yeah, all that's included. But it is interesting of how the Bible's very specific sometimes, and we kind of go, well, I just don't know. I just, And, and the truth is we do know. These are the things that, these are the works of the flesh. And he says this, and this is something we need to heed to. He says, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, people will participate in some of these things, or as he says it, things like these, and they say, oh, but God's grace covers my life. Oh, God's mercy is enough. He knows how I am. Uh, It tells me right here that there is a dividing line. There There is this line that if you engage this, there is an aspect, a now what moment, of being caught, that we've got to look at. So now what? Now what? When someone is caught, that question, now what, is very loud and clear. And maybe, maybe you're here, maybe you're watching online, and you struggle in one of these areas, or an area like this, it says. Uh, now what? Well, Scripture's pretty specific when it comes to our spiritual walk and what our spiritual walk should produce See, our spiritual walk produces something. You can't just say, I'm walking by the Spirit, and it not produce something godly, spiritual. Uh, you can't walk by the Spirit, and it produce something worldly. It just doesn't work that way. But oftentimes, people will walk worldly, and then they believe that something spiritual is being produced, and that th- these are contrary to each other. So we've got to look at this. We've got to talk about this. I want to give you some moments, uh, some dynamics here that are part of this now what idea and being caught. If you're taking notes, write this down, the spiritual dynamics of being caught. When someone finds themselves caught, that could be a reality of uh, of that situation, uh, their reality is often because of the discernment of someone else. So I want you to think about this. When someone finds themselves caught, Good, bad, ugly, it doesn't matter. Uh, Their reality is often because of the discernment of someone else. So how should a Christian, how should a follower of Jesus Christ behave when when discerning something about someone else? Now think of that. You're a Christian, you're walking by the Spirit, and you discern something about somebody else in the aspect of caught. 
you've caught them, and let's just say it's something that's not godly. It's something that's not, it, it's, it's of the flesh. Uh, how should a Christian behave? Well, the flip side is how should someone who would proclaim they're a Christian behave when they are caught? So you have these two dynamics going on. How, how should a Christian act in one way, and how should a Christian act when they're caught? It's all part of discernment. Let me give you a definition. Discernment is the ability to see through what may not be obvious to the eye. Now you put a spiritual lens on this, the ability to see through, uh, the ability to see through what may not be obvious to the eye. When I think we're walking by the Spirit. There is an aspect, a a gift of the Spirit, I believe, of discernment that sometimes God lays on us about a situation, about a person. You look at that, that's part of discernment. Again, we're talking about spiritually speaking. This idea of discernment, the understanding, something people often confuse in the area of discernment, is that that you can't practice godly discernment if you don't walk by the Spirit. There's people who... They have discernment, but it's not godly discernment. They have discernment. They see a situation. They have some logic about them. They have uh, some wisdom about them. They got some life experience about them, and they go, you know, I just really feel God's telling me. But the truth is, is the fruits of their life, they're not walking in the Spirit. They're not walking a godly walk. They're not obeying the Lord. They may have some insight. They may have some intellect about it, but it's not true spiritual discernment. We've got to look at that because it's imperative that God's people walk by the Spirit. It's imperative that God's people, their walk is producing fruits of the Spirit. We'll talk about that here in a second. I truly believe that a person cannot trust what they sense in their spirit if they are not filled with the Spirit. That's a strong statement. But I think there's a lot of people going, well, I know my life's in shambles, and I know it's producing a bunch of junk, and I know, uh, and you're probably going to think I'm a hypocrite, but I really think you should, well, that's fine, and that's feelings, and that may be experience, but that may not be spiritual discernment. And we've got to be careful. Therefore, it's imperative, again, we walk by the Spirit, because the Spirit of God, walking by the Spirit, being filled with the Spirit, produces specific things. Just like there's specific things that are of the flesh, there are specific things that are of the Spirit. Galatians 5 tells us, Galatians 5, 22 through 26, it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, key word here, gentleness, and self-control. We'll come back to gentleness in a moment. Self-control. Against such things there is no law. Why is there no law against such things? Because these are produced of the Spirit. They don't need the law. They don't need, this is a product of the Spirit in operation in someone's life who is walking by the Spirit, filled with the Spirit. Amen? And those who belong to Christ, Jesus, he says, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. How have they done that? They've walked by the Spirit. They've walked in the Spirit. If you're struggling with crucifying that flesh, if you're struggling with going back to to the fleshly things of what was listed out before, uh, you need to step in closer, more in step with the Spirit of God. You've got to get more into what God is into, and it changes you. Those desires change. It says it here. They've crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Verse 25 tells us, if we live by the Spirit... Let us also keep in step with the Spirit. It says, let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. See, we're not to compare our lives to each other. A lot of people get hung up on this. You know, uh, to the point that we say, here's what you need to do, uh, you know, or uh, this person, you know, they're just not as holy as this person. The truth is, is no one's holy without the Lord. I wish I was as good a Christian as they were. Uh, There's no comparison here. Just follow Jesus. (laughs) Just get in step with Jesus. Uh, We're not to compare our lives to each other. We all need a Savior. Every single person in this room, we're all messed up. You know, at this point I thought, you know, maybe I need to say, uh, say that with me. We're all messed up. The comparison of our holiness, our purity, uh, our giftedness, those things that maybe God is wanting to work 
work out through us, work out in us. Uh, it's not in comparison to each other, but to him. Uh, we don't compare our lives with one another. We compare uh, to our ultimate example, Jesus Christ, in following him. That's what we're to do. Uh, this is where we need to accept his grace to cover us completely. Uh, so when someone gets caught, when someone gets caught, their response to being caught sheds light on their motives. It sheds light on the intention of the heart. When somebody is aware or it's made, they're made aware that they're walking in the flesh, they're, they're walking in their own power, they're walking in their own understanding of, they're engaging some of these things or things like those, it says. When, when you see their response, it's very telling. The one who catches someone is revealing as well. Um, how is someone to act when they catch someone in sin? Well, Galatians, again, it tells us, Galatians 6.1, it says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression... You who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. There's that word. Keep watch on yourself lest you too be tempted. We're going to come back to that scripture in a moment. It's very powerful here. It gives instruction of a person being caught. It gives instruction to a person who maybe has caught them. Because both have to have godly responses. Both have to. Write this down, the spiritual dynamics of being caught. When someone finds themselves caught, their way out is often because of the spirituality of someone else. Their way out is often because of the spirituality of someone else. Let's go back to the Galatians 6.1 scripture. It says, Galatians 6.1, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual. Key here, I underlined it. We'll come back should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Gentleness, keeping watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. There's quite a dynamic going on here. I think there's a lot of needless hurt that goes in and out of the church because we don't get this scripture. We don't get the imperative of walking in the spirit because we just kind of think that there will be a day that we just kind of, we just kind of get it, and we just kind of, uh, I'm better today, and, and I'm better tomorrow, and I'm better. Yes, there's an element of that, but we live in a broken, sinful world that every day, I didn't need a Savior last week. I need a Savior today, too. I need to walk very close with my Savior, and so do you. And I need to learn from Him, and I need to gain that insight so that as I walk in the Spirit, the spiritual fruit is being produced from my life, even in situations where I may be in the person who got caught or I am the person who maybe caught someone else. It's all, it must be under God's plan, under God's guidance, under that spirit of walking. So let's look at this, uh, that way out, that understanding. It says this, you who are spiritual. I think that's key, you who are spiritual. You who are spiritual, let that sink in. Notice it didn't refer to those who are smart, crafty, logical, or religious. It says you who are spiritual. If you've caught somebody, you who are spiritual, as we grow, our spirit uh, uh, discernment grows. I believe as we walk close with the Lord, our spirit of discernment grows. We be can begin to not just speak wisdom, but speak life into situations. Not judgment. Though, though it's... It's okay to call something out, but it's, it's not okay to tell somebody how horrible and terrible they are. <laughs> Aren't you thankful God doesn't do that with us? God goes, oh, you messed up again. You're such a worthless, terrible follower. He doesn't do that. He tells us sometimes, get up. Get up, come follow me. You got to come close here. You're not getting it. I, you who are spiritual, it says, uh, but we're to grow in that. You know, you ever see a, a, a child, uh, when they're little, you maybe play hide-and-go-seek with them, and they go run across the room, go hide, and they run across the room, and they look at you, and they put their hands over their eyes. They can't see you, therefore you can't see them. That's kind of their, their discernment right there. 
But now, if they're still doing that at 10, 12, 15 years of age, you know, something was a misfire. <laughs> but we know their discernment grows. Uh, spiritually, our discernment grows. Some of the things maybe you did early on as a follower of Christ, you look back and you go, whew, I I've, I'm glad I've passed that. I'm glad I, I, I kind of have grown up in my understanding, my, my faith. Uh, you ever watch a movie? And maybe you saw it years ago. Maybe you saw it as a kid or you saw it as a teenager. You saw this movie. But in your mind, it was a really good movie. In your mind, it was, uh, that was something that I had this moment. I'm not going to tell you the movie. And uh, had this moment. And this was just such a cool movie growing up. I was a teenager, later teens. And I remember uh, <laughs> Hunter and Sierra, they're about maybe 8, 10, something like that, that age range. And it's our kids. And... Uh, I said, oh, hey, we'll watch this movie. And so I turn it on, and I'm like, oh, I didn't remember that. Oh, I didn't, oh, my word. Okay, yeah. Uh, okay, let's watch a different movie. Well, what changed? The movie didn't change. My discernment changed. So I, I grew. You know, I, funny but wrong, right? A lot of things kind of fall in those categories, and we can swim in that, but I remember at that time, age range for them, I'm going, oh, wow, okay, yeah, I, I didn't remember that, but I do now. I think spiritual discernment happens that way. Things that you may be used to think was no big deal, but you've grown, and, and now you're going, you know what, that actually, that, that might actually be a big deal. That might actually be something, but here's what I, I think is often happening, is people are trying to get more flippant with walking in the spirit. It's not that big a deal. And, and actually the reverse happens. And we invite more things of the flesh, excusing it away with things like, well, that's just culture. Oh, that's just how the world is. See, normalizing sin doesn't change God's plan. Just because culture might normalize lifestyle but normalize things that are blatant sin in Scripture doesn't mean it's not sin any longer. Doesn't mean it won't separate you from God. That as the Scripture said, these things of the flesh, it says those who participate or those who are in things like these, it blankets it, said will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's huge. We've got to keep growing in the Lord, drawing closer to him. And that's where we experience those desires of the flesh begin to be squelched. Those desires of the flesh begin to be pressed down, pushed away. It says, those you who are spiritual. It says, to restore. That word restore, uh, the Greek word for the, for the word restore is the same word you would use if, if somebody had a shoulder out of place. Uh, they had an accident, their shoulder came out of place, and you were going to put that shoulder back into place. That word, that Greek word that is used here in that scripture, to restore them, is the same word you would use to put a limb back into place. The care, the, the, the love, the tenderness that you would take to put somebody's limb, you wouldn't go, oh man, that looks like it hurts. All right, let's get that in there. Okay, listen for the pop. You know, you wouldn't do that. This is being used in a spiritual sense. Those who are spiritual to restore them, that tender, loving care it would take to put a limb back into place. That's, that's truly the, the full definition of that word it uses here. Uh, it says, in a spirit of gentleness. Well, gentleness is one of the fruits of the spirit. I mean, how many times people will come to somebody and go, man, you're messing up. You're going to burn in hell for that true? Maybe true. Um, here, let me, let me put your life back into place. And they're going, I really don't want you touching me. I really don't think you appreciate the pain and the situation I'm in. If you could, if you could pull back from a, a spiritual moment of a sinner and an opportunity to put them back into place, that's what this scripture does. Spirit of gentleness. It's a fruit of the spirit. Uh, it says, keep watch on yourself. I, I think this is, this is powerful in this scripture because it's not just talking about the one who was caught, but it's talking about the one who has walked into a situation spiritually to restore and have gentleness, but there's a warning to that person. 
It says, keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. So this spiritual battle, this spiritual dynamic can, can cause us to do it wrong, to fight it wrong, to, to actually, I think, cause damage needlessly. It says, keep watching yourself, lest you too be tempted. Uh, remember, we're all on the same level of playing field here. Uh, we're all sinners saved by grace. At the end of the day, we all need a Savior. And it doesn't matter how spiritually or uh, uh, spiritually attuned you are, or elite you may think you are, or how long you've walked this life. Uh, you're a sinner who needs God's grace, just like that person needs God's grace. That doesn't mean you water down truth. It doesn't mean you just, when you restore, it's as though you're putting a limb back into place. There's, there's love felt in this situation, not condemnation. Jesus never did that. Actually, he came and did the exact opposite of that. It's tough. Galatians 6, 2, it says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Uh, Galatians is a powerful book. I encourage you to read the whole book. Uh, Hebrews 13, 13, 3, 13 says, But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by this deceitfulness of sin. I mean, deceitfulness of sin, uh, it, it twists, it, it manipulates. That's what sin does. Uh, Galatians 6, 3 through 5, it says, For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. To catch people in sin is not what God's called us to do. What God's called us to do is to restore people back into a relationship with him. And he uses our lives to do it. See, you and I can't save anyone. But we can lead them to the Savior. And if in our opinion, in our anger, in our response... If we miss the opportunity, we could set a path for them for destruction for life. That's a big deal. Big deal. That's the warning in this scripture. For if anyone thinks he's something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Verse 4 says, but let each one test his own work. And then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. Again, not that comparison. For each will have to bear his own load. Uh, scripture tells us to each will bear his own cross. Uh, each one of us comes before the Lord, not on the apron string of our parents or our grandparents, but each one of us becomes, uh, comes before the Lord. See, whether you're the one caught or the one caught who, who caught someone else, there's a need for the Spirit of God in both respects. See, we need the Spirit of God in both respects for people that are walking in the Spirit and for people who have been caught but the goal is to bring them in. The goal is to restore them. The goal is to be gentle, to have that fruit of the Spirit evident. I think if the church can get a hold of this, I think we'll see more people one to Jesus. One gives a person an opportunity or a chance to receive hope in this dynamic. The other spiritual working gives a person an opportunity or chance to bring hope. Powerful. Now what? Now what? You've heard me say this. You're either a missionary or a mission field. You know, in this context, both are in operation. A missionary is reaching those who are a mission field and, and vice versa. There, there is this opportunity as we walk in the Spirit. It is for us, but it's also through us. That's God's plan. Both sides are the workings of being caught. They're, they're spiritual. And if you're caught in sin, you confess it. You don't cover it. You, you, you own it. But a lot of times those excuses rise. Let me give you another spiritual dynamic, spiritual dynamics of being caught. When someone finds themselves caught, their hope is often because of the carefulness of someone else. Think about that. Their hope is often because of the carefulness of someone else. We've got to be careful when spiritually, when representing Christ and spiritually walking into a situation where somebody is caught in sin. We've got to be careful with that. We've got to, uh, the, again, that tenderness to restore, that tenderness to bring back. So many times we just want somebody to pray the sinner's prayer and right there and just say it and, and now, now your arm's set. Go, be free. <laughs> Imagine putting somebody's arm back into place. It's popped out and then patting them on the shoulder and say, go get them, tiger. You know, they're like, I'm kind of sore. I've got, it's kind of a, you know, sometimes the spiritual happens too. 
that way. Somebody's, uh, God's working on them. God is, God is developing them. God is uh, guiding them. Maybe there's some steps here that they're going to have to take, that they're going to have to make some things right. They're going to have to experience uh, his forgiveness. Uh, there's some complications. There's some consequences. There's some stuff happening. And maybe it didn't all work out just like that. Uh, that's our opportunity to walk in the Spirit with them. That's your opportunity to speak life to them. That though things may not seem perfect, you have one who's with you who is perfect. And it's not me. It's the Spirit of God. And he's walking with you. He's going to get you through this. And it's a step at a time. And there's encouragement. And I want to see more of that in our church. Amen? I close with this. If you have spiritually discerned and caught someone, ask permission to speak into his or her life. You know what? I've been praying for you. God's, God's put you on my heart and my mind. And here's some things I'm, I'm, I'm seeing. And maybe you begin to lay it out. You know, there's this big element of earning the right to be heard in somebody's life. You know, sometimes uh, somebody doesn't hear from you for 10 years, and then all of a sudden you call them up or you see them out there, and then all of a sudden you just blast their situation in their face. It's as though uh, you just walk up to a person who's got a limb out of place and you just go, here, let me get that for you. And they didn't ask you to do it. Maybe they've been holding off. They know how painful this is going to be and I'm just, uh, I need to take a few breaths. I need to, I think spiritually speaking, sometimes we, we have great opportunities before us, but we can blow it really quick. If we walk in there, contrary to the Spirit, I believe God through this message is going to lay some people a perspective maybe they didn't have. That's my prayer. Because there's people in your life that maybe you've written off. You uh, you know, you know the old say, hurt people hurt people. I mean, if somebody's walking around with a limb out of place, uh, they're going to probably walk a little different. They're going to respond a little different. And they might be a little sensitive. But spiritually hurt, spiritually lost people are the same way. They need a spiritual person. That's what the scripture says. Those of you who are spiritual. Well, you're spiritual if you're walking in the spirit. If you're not walking in the spirit, you're not spiritual. If you're walking in the spirit, those of you that are spiritual, then you can engage that person who's lost, that person who's hurt, that person who needs to know things are going to be okay in Jesus Christ because you're walking by the Spirit and that fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, those things are right there. It's part of your life. That's the fruit. And if you realize at some point that that's not evident in your life, those things are lacking in your life, uh, somewhere along the way, you're you're not walking in the Spirit got to be corrected. That's got to be brought before the Lord. God, where am I doing it my way and not yours? God, where am I trying to live out justice as I see it and not yours? Where am I wanting justice over grace? Where am I wanting judgment over mercy? God, guide me in your spirit. That'll change you, church. But here's the thing. It's a downline effect. It'll change those around you. It'll change those that you come in contact with. Don't let being caught allow excuses to leave you uncovered, exposed, or in a captured state. There's life after after being caught. And my thought is, is that it's not always the person that's doing this blatant sin that's caught. Sometimes it's the person who knows what it is to walk in the spirit, but they're just watering it down. They're just trying to straddle the fence. They're just trying, there's an aspect of being caught there and that may be some of you here tonight. Colossians 1, 10 through 14. I'm gonna ask you to stand all across this room. I want you to picture maybe you were this church in, that Paul is writing to here in the New Testament. And he's, He's got your life in mind here. Like this letter is to you. I'm going to ask my prayer team to come. And my prayer out of the 
out of the fruit of this sermon is that there will be people restored back to Jesus. That there will be people who have been just kind of walking their own way, knowing the way they should walk in, the Spirit of God, but maybe participating in things that they thought, man, you know, it's no big, ah, maybe I'm making more out of it than I should. But that, that they will be reminded of how pivotal it is that we walk very close to Jesus, so close that we, we have those things, those fruits of the Spirit evident in our life. This letter is for you, Colossians 1, 10 through 14. The Apostle Paul says, walk in a manner worthy of the Lord fully pleasing him fully pleasing to him bearing fruit it's talking about the spiritual fruit in every good work and in increasing in the knowledge of God that's how we're to walk church he says being strengthened with all power what kind of power Holy Spirit power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy he's listing out fruits of the spirit here giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you. He's qualified you. Not your idea of you. Not someone else's idea of you. He's qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son in whom we have redemption. Amen? The forgiveness of sins. I mean, that's good news on every level. But we walk by the Spirit, amen? We gotta walk by the Spirit. We gotta stay in step with the Spirit. If we're gratifying the desires of the flesh, somewhere we're misstepping. Somewhere we're watering it down. Somewhere we're missing the opportunity to experience true freedom. Don't have to cover up how I, how I live my life when I walk by the Spirit. I don't have to cover my responses in certain situations. I don't have to cover it. I'm walking by the Spirit. As we walk by the Spirit, we keep a step with the Spirit. We win battles in our own lives, but we begin to make ways for others to win battles in theirs. And all of a sudden, people begin to experience the fruit of the Spirit from our lives. That'll change people. That'll change people, amen? What an amazing word we just heard. Click here for video announcements and click here to subscribe and stay connected with Crosswalk Online.